Hello and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and I'm thrilled as always to be here with you. Uh, for those that watch part one of our interview with David Sanchez, you're in for an even further treat with part two. Um, my brother-in-arms, Paul Bindig, is here with me for the most of this interview, uh, but he had to duck out to live the life of a rock star and catch a flight just towards the end, hence me recording this um, solo. So, But again, thank you, Paul, for taking part. Um, so as you'll hear in part two of this interview with David Sanchez, we work further back in David's career, covering everything from Eric Clapton and Bruce Springsteen uh, and Sting and Peter Gabriel uh, and a whole lot more in between, including David's Desert Island Discs. Hope you enjoy this second part as much as the first, and I'll talk to you after the show. And you mentioned uh, earlier Sting and Peter Gabriel. Uh, making mm. contributions to this uh, this project, and we, we have to ask you as we as we move our way through a bit, little bit further into the recent past, the the mm -hmm. 2016 Rock Paper Scissors tour with a, an amazing double headline, Sting and Peter Gabriel. I would 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 love to get your reflections on on being part of that and what what that was like for you as a, a musician. <laughs> My recollections of that tour. It's a great project. You know, it's really funny, and uh, maybe. I don't know, the, the golden age of touring. Was there such a thing? I don't know. It's different moving around the world now, uh, not just because of our whole medical, you know, the pandemic and everything, but there was quite an age uh, where um, it was possible and very interesting to move around. But again, to get back to your original question, uh, what was that tour like? It was, it was kind of like music camp but not summer, you know? Um, and we were in, it was in the States, if I remember correctly. I'll tell you what, I remember the first, the first day of rehearsal. First of all, as a, as, a, as, a, as a project, I thought this is really interesting, okay? Really interesting because, not just solely because I, I had recorded and toured with both artists for years, you know? I'm on a bunch of Sting records and then more tours than I can remember. It. And a lot of this stuff with Peter as well. I go, wow, this is going to be interesting for me. And once you figure out the, the logistics of who's playing with who, when, and all that kind of stuff, which took a minute. But um, the vibe was great, I got to say. I, I really have to say. Overall, it was great. There was a little bit of working out. Um, um, again, this thing of who's going to do what and when. So not just on the level of the bands, because you're integrating... Uh, you're interfacing two bands. So, as to your occasion, what was it like? The vibe on that? It was good fun. New York is one of the most incredible cities on the planet Earth in the Milky Way galaxy. But I'm not a fan of the weather there. <laughs> and I remember those rehearsals. It was winter. It was cold. It was flipping cold. Man. You had to be bundled up like crazy. So, I remember that. Was it uh, SIR Studios rehearsing? So, you walk into this place, and I'm thinking, like, Okay, and at that point, Sting's ensemble, I think we were a sextet at that time. Myself, uh, Dominic Miller, Vinny Pagliuta Sting, um, Joe Lowry, and Peter Jekyll on violin. So, all right, we're in. And we were all very cool with each other, our ensemble. And uh, I knew some of the guys peripherally in Paul's thing, not closely, but seen him. So we walk in the rehearsal. It was like this gigantic, it was like a, a, a bomb went off in a music store. So to get to the stage was like, you're walking in the room, and we, of course we had the biggest room, the A room, where you could put an orchestra in the different thing. And you walk in the room, well, where's my, where's you, oh, we're on this side of the stage, we're on the stage, right? And how do I get there exactly? It was like a, not a minefield, but it was a whole path that you had to walk through other people's setups to get to your station to sit down to do anything. So that was interesting. And that took quite a lot of work. The texts were like, you know, these, they don't take it casually. It's like we, some guy says, hey, we're going to do this and do that. It's on somebody to figure out physically exactly where is everything going to go, where two drum kits going to go. You know, there were two keyboard players. Uh, it was basically, I don't want to go on about, there was a lot of stuff. So that was a fun day. You walk in and find you, how do I get to my station? And then the whole thing starts, and it just kind of kicked in. 
And uh, a couple of logistic moments where uh, Paul and Stanger figuring out, you know, who's going to sing what line, what song's going to go first. A lot of that I sort of just got to sort of watch. I could maybe chime in. I would occasionally get and ask my opinion. Like he would look over, Sting would look over me and ask me something. Like, what do you think? <laughs> what do you, you know, it's very, really casual. Not like, you know, this is not like on the debate floor. So like, I don't know, we could do this, we do that. What do you think? And I'd, I'd say something. But that all got worked out. And then it became uh, the enjoyment of uh, the, the musicians of both bands being so physically close to each other. And that is really what it was about. And I remember uh, his bass player, I'm going to say his name wrong, um, uh, Begidi. He played on, the, on uh, Paul Simon's on that, um, that famous African, all that stuff he did. Graceland, bass. yeah. Graceland, yeah. And excuse me for giving his name, but for that whole project, we were like super, super close. It's like, you know, here's me, here's him. But in a, in a good physical way, but we had eye contact all night long, and we just got to enjoy, you know, hearing each other super close up and personal, and enjoy because he was playing on some songs that that uh, I was playing in. I was playing in some of the songs where it's Paul Simon's music, but just yeah, they kicked in and these people across the stage. I remember his guitar player, uh, Mark, beautiful guy, beautiful guy. It's like long hair. It looks it looks like like from the 60s be a beautiful you just got that decided to like yeah hippies are great and i'm going to be one for the rest of my life you know he's really fantastic guitarist and i just remember his first name and his other keyboard player steve his drummer so again i'm i'm diffusing but uh the experience was one of really a lot of uh camaraderie amongst musicians who really uh, we, we enjoyed each other's company, and luckily, the two main artists had such a good body of music to keep you engaged musically. There was just a lot to enjoy. There was a lot to enjoy there, even when there were some songs where, like, I'm not in it. I'm like, I'm sitting in a chair, you know, next to the other guy who's not in it, or the other girl or woman who's not in it, and I'm just digging the show, you know. So it was a lot of that. It was great. That, that's great. And, and uh, you mentioned yourself, David, this came off the back of uh, a number of tours with either Peter or, or, or Sting. So just tell us a little bit about your experience with Peter Gabriel and, and the touring experience w with him, because he's a, obviously a very different artist again. Mm -hmm. Peter's a sweetheart. He's a real, uh, um, an adequate use of the, the G word for him as an artist he's truly brilliant he's a visionary and again peter's one of these people where what he's chosen to give his time and his energy to the causes and the issues that he supported verbally financially physically from way back in the day how about before everybody we've all got these things in our hands now you know i won't leave home without this thing in my hand okay well, how about setting up a situation where he's paying for cameras, high quality cameras, to be sent to people in conflict areas to take pictures, to, to document what's going on in these areas and so that the world would know. He was a foot, he was a, a, a few steps ahead of the technology. He really was. It's like, okay, this is possible. It's possible in this kind of analog, kind of funky way. You know, here's a hard device, put it in a box, send it to someone. You know, that's a kind of quasi old way. But look at the effect that he had, the things that he set up with programs like Witness and all the things that he got started, Amnesty International, so that people would know. So he's a real, uh, again, he's, he's in every way, shape, or the form. I don't think he's not just as an artist. Of course, he's a great artist, but I once was going through passport control with him. And the, the guy, on my passport says, uh, David Sanchez, so-and-so, from America, United Citizen, musician. That's what I do, musician. And Peter had declined to put something in there or put something else in there that would made it a bit vague for the passport guy to let us proceed to the next country. And he was, like, questioning him. And he was like, I don't know, he got through it. And he said he put, like, humanitarian. 
He says, I don't want to be described as just that. I don't want my description to be just, just that. But he had to be just something. He was frustrated about that. I can't be, you know, three or four. They had to be like, what are you? Bang. And so that was kind of the conversation. He was like, I, I don't want to really, I'm not comfortable being described as just that. If you got to call me something, call me what I really am on my deepest level. And I think he felt like his efforts to help society and humanity held probably a little higher notch than just being identified as a successful musician on the planet Earth kind of thing. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, he's a, Peter's a sweetheart. He's a sweetheart. I love him dearly. The way that we came to work together was, I'm at home, <clears throat> and I'm, again, I'm just trying to get over myself. I'm like, oh, God, I got an album. I got a record contract. I got an album myself. It's being played. One day, man, I was in the car with my mom. And we were, uh, I used to, I, before I moved uh, out of New Jersey, uh, she lived in Belmar, and Asbury Park was the nearest town. So we were in the car together. Forest Feelings was released, and there was a radio station back then called WPLJ out of Newark, New Jersey. And I'm, I'm just driving my car. We're doing errands. And I'm in the car, and my album comes on the AM radio. Forrest of Phoenix, a song from an album, came on the radio. Are you kidding me? First of all, that's not radio music, really. Forrest of Felix, you know what I mean? That's sort of like, you know, jazzy fusion the early days of that. And we're listening in the car, and we look at each other, and we just lost it. I felt, I never remember that moment of like, uh, pride is too weak a word. Pride is weak. Pride is weak to that. It was like this joyous thing of like, you're kidding me. This woman who taught me how to do what I do years ago, it came all this way, and now we're in a car in our hometown, driving to another area, and it's on the radio. It might sound small to like some people, but for for me, for us, it was like, oh man, that was such a moment. Man. What I before I digress, it's like, how did we even meet? Okay, here it is. I'm at home after getting over myself and this experience of myself on the radio with my dear mother in the car. I get a phone call from a record company. I said, David, we have a, here we go, how old yours truly is. We have a telegram, a telegram from Peter Gabriel. Really? Now, I knew who Peter Gabriel was. I'm a big fan of, well, that's, I knew well who he was. Because we have a telegram from Peter Gabriel. He's heard your new your album. He's heard your first album. He's expressed that he's leaving Genesis. He's going to do his first solo album. And he'd like to know if you would be interested in being a part of his recording. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> That's how we met. That's how that whole thing started. And then uh, uh, maybe a week or so, 10 days later... Uh, he actually flew to New York. I was living in Long Branch, New Jersey at the time. And he flew to New York. And Peter is sort of uh, notorious for carrying things in bags, like, you know, Sainsbury bags and cassettes full of like, stuff. And sure enough, I don't think he's quite as bad the way he was back then, but he showed up with a, a bag full of like, cassettes and uh, sketches of music from what would end up being uh, Security, his first solo album. Uh, I think he actually stayed with me for a day or so. See, somewhere down there. And uh, I took him to rehearsal. Uh, Tone was rehearsing. We used to rehearse on this farm in Long Branch, New Jersey. He stayed like, for three or four days or so. And he played me stuff. Uh, you know, very haltingly back then. I'm sure he's a bit better at it now. But he's very, uh, not shy, but he's very... Um, He's modest about his p piano playing. He can play, you know. He can certainly play whatever he writes, you know. But he's showing me these songs. It just sounds great to me, you know. And it kind of went on like that. And then uh, he had to go. And they presented us with a schedule for recording. And it was going to be done in Canada with this producer, Bob Ezrin. And they were, were going to record it in Canada. And what happened was... Or, again, the record company, uh, you know, we had a touring schedule. We had a product out, and it was like we had a whole college day. So I used to book us. I'm sure that I played every single college in the Northeast United States 
from the northernmost tip of the whatever state, you know, near whatever's up there at the tip, all the way down to Florida, okay? You know, and then we would move a little bit into Chicago, into the Midwest. But us, it was like, we were like coast. It was like East Coast, West Coast, you know? And less on the West Coast, not because we weren't welcome, but just that wasn't our town. But the middle of the country was kind of like a little bit Chicago, uh, you know, um, you know, we were in Cleveland and places like that. But um, we, we, I couldn't do it, basically, long story. I brought myself back then. We could not um, accommodate their recording schedule, and we just couldn't lose all that work. So that didn't happen. But uh, he very kindly stayed in touch after that. You know, he went ahead and made the record. I get Larry Fast and other people. Uh, but he stayed in touch after that. So every time he would be in America uh, playing in the Northeast, I would get an invite to the show. I remember one time he was playing in Boston somewhere. And I think we were on the road as, as well. That's why I remember. Tone was on the road and he was he was on the road too. We got a he was playing somewhere in Boston and we were somewhere close by. And he said, Yeah, come to the show. And he had tickets for us, uh, for, uh, for all of us. And any time I was a couple more times like that to where wherever he was in New York, uh, I would get an invite to the show. And then in nineteen eighty six I got a phone call saying, uh, uh, Peter's got this new album, So, that's out, and uh, he wants, he's about to go on a long tour, and he doesn't want to use the same band. I mean, he'd really like to know if he'd be interested in being part of the touring band. He changed, he changed drummers in the middle of the session. Manu Cache came in and redid a lot of the drums on that. And uh, I didn't do any of the, excuse me, any of the So uh, album stuff, but all the all the live stuff after that, I did. So I said, yes, absolutely, I'd be interested. And then that was the start of uh, a lot of touring with him. So tour, 86, 87, Amnesty International, 88. Uh, some stuff that uh, used to endure and for UNICEF in Africa. And, and then other tours that I can't. Uh, you know what's funny? I, I have a hard time. It's been a hard time, but I just recently got a lot of stuff from my storage. I have kept every single tour book from my entire career. Now, the first time I ever got a real tour book was on a Santana tour, 1981, I want to say. And it was a world tour. The tour was like Santana, Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, right? Bob was headlining, obviously. Joan was opening. Uh, for us, and then Santana. I was in Santana playing keyboards and guitar, and then Bob would play. But I have kept every single tour book. That was the first book where, I like, in the E Street Band, it would be like, "Who's driving the car today?" All right, Vinny's driving. All right, and you can figure out well, where's the next. It was like on your own to figure out kind of where you're going. Somebody knew they would get a thing from the office. Vinny's driving. Where's the next city? Chicago. Okay, how much time? But it wasn't like a piece of paper saying the venue, the venue time, the distance from where you are to the next venue, all that important stuff, the hotel numbers, really professional, you know, like, and I remember the first time I got one, I was like, this is fucking cool, man. this is very cool, so I, but I have all of them, and uh, I'm going to start my memoir uh, uh, this oh, summer, right. I am, it's time, I, I've, I've already got some little sketches of it down, but uh I've I've got a photos of of every uh, every single tour book uh, that I did. It, it'd be it'd be an amazing collection, and uh, the memoir would be definitely worth uh, definitely worth reading. And um, I'll tell you I, what, I it's, got, to... it's, it's got some serious hotels, son. Some of the best hotels on the planet Earth. <laughs> if you're in Italy, <laughs> you know, to go around Europe. Yeah, yeah. I could, I could hook you up. <laughs> so, so off the back of that uh, Amnesty tour that you did with Peter Gabriel, uh, you, you found yourself again working with Bruce Springsteen uh, on the on the Human Touch album. Mm. And I'm I'm curious mm. as to your recollections of that time. Human Touch. It goes back to that relationship, like you said. Bruce and I have always been dear, dear friends. We will die, dear friends. The only person, actually that I have a similar relationship with, that I knew and was close to as a teenager and then professionally and, and long in life, that's Ernest Carter, you know? 
the, the drummer and Tony was drummer briefly in the E Street Band. That's it, man. We were teenagers together. We all met and went through all this stuff. But it's 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 him and Bruce basically, and excuse me, also Gary Talent, Gary Talent. Got to include because Gary is responsible for introducing me to Bruce and getting the whole thing started because Gary and I had done a recording session privately for somebody a few weeks before we got on like a house of fire. It was great. I love him to this day. He's such a dear, dear soul. And uh, one night walking into Upstage in Asbury Park, Bruce and Gary are organizing a jam session. Gary sees me. I'm walking up the stairs, introduced me to Bruce. Bruce invites me to play. Here we are years later. But the human touch, how I ended up on that was, I was in Los Angeles on a completely different recording session for a blues artist. I was working for this producer named Alan Douglas. Remember this guy's name? He did a lot of post uh, after Jimi Hendrix passed away. Somehow this guy, Alan Douglas, got a hold of a whole bunch of fucking tapes and shit. Anyway, he did some, did what he did. He was producing this blues artist, <clears throat> and I, I got a call to come and do that. So I'm in Los Angeles, and I'm in my hotel, and uh, before I was headed off to that my session, a whole other part of town, I get a call from Bruce, his producer, and they say, hey, man, we're here in town. We're, we're, we're at, uh, I forget where they recorded that, Criterion or somewhere. Um, you know, do you want to come by? You know, how long are you in town for? I'd say for like five days or something. He says, yeah, please come by. And so I, I went by, and uh, he had about, I think I did two or three songs. Uh, Soul Driver. And so he's a big B3 fan, Bruce is, the piano and everything. So that's how that happened. He, he heard I was in town, and, uh, you know, that's a, but I, I love that. Uh, it's, it's casual, but it's solid. It's also very solid, you know. So, and that was great. I forget what else I'm like. There's a, that's a double album, right? Human Touch and Lucky Town was the two albums in there. Double. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Da David, I wanted to ask you something, um, which is something I'm picking up from, from our, our interaction that we're having. You, you worked with, um, well, on that album, uh, Bruce uh, had uh, the great Jeff Porcaro on, uh, on drums and per percussion there. But but you've mentioned quite a few amazing drummers that you've that you've worked with, and we and we really only scratched the surface so far. And I'm I'm interested in. I've always thought that keyboard players and drummers are kind of brothers because you you you're both playing percussion instruments, and you yeah. have that that relationship. And uh, and I'd love to get your impression on the value of, of working well with with a, with a great drummer because I I think it's something you could give us a bit of insight on based on your experience? That's a really great question, man. And uh, I, I won't digress, I'll go straight into it. It's everything for me. And it, we, technically, because of the reason you said, we are both uh, percussionists, right? The piano is a percussion instrument. You can't look at it, you can't like blow on it and make a sound. It's like anything, you know? You could look at a snare drum or a, or a, a conga drum. If you don't touch it somehow, you get nothing. You know, so there's a unity right there, and that's a deep unity, the rhythm of it. The fact that we both have to rhythmically touch our instruments to produce a sound. And I find personally rhythm, here's where I won't digress for once, David, thank you. I personally have always found rhythm so inspirational. I don't, it, it's not like you need to have rhythm. I can be completely inspired without rhythm. Really, you don't, it's not like I need a beat to get somewhere. It's not that at all. It really isn't. But when there is rhythm of any kind, even if it's like a solid groove in a, a time, four, four, six, eight, whatever, even if it's the rhythm of like, like a bird's chirping, those are notes. That's a, that's a thing in it. That's, that's something, you know? It's just something about it, but God help us all, man. You give me a good drummer, I go to war. We could change the world, man, with the right percussionist. That's why I love what I, what we get up to so much. With Will Calhoun and myself, what I've done with uh, with with Vinny, the songs like like on uh, on Eyes Wide Open, uh, but yeah, you know, War in Heaven. The inspiration for that one was Vinny and I are both. Um, 
um, fans of John Coltrane. And years and years ago, there is a, a record called Interstellar Space, which is John Coltrane and Rashid Ali on drums. And the entire record is tenor saxophone and drums. And it's all improvisation. There's no tunes, there's, not, there's nothing rehearsed. There's nothing, there's no bass, there's no, there's nothing else except tenor saxophone and drums. And it is one of the most amazing things you ever hear. It is not casual listening. And if a person, if you're not familiar with, let's say, I don't know, entry level jazz, maybe, it might just sound like an onslaught of stuff to you. But if you have any sort of connection to, you know, the avant-garde or the, or the sort of bebop or the post-bop to see how bebop became slightly post-bop and then avant-garde and here comes Miles and here comes all these things. And, you know, if you have any connection to that, if your ears can, can ever take it, uh, it's an incredible piece of music. And we both were inspired by that. And I wanted to do some, I, I had sort of written the tune to sound like that. There's going to be nothing but like uh, uh, tenor set. And I do it on the, the VL1, virtual acoustic synthesizer. You have to blow into the thing to get sound. And drums. And he was all for it, you know. And uh, similar kind of thing as I did um, for Bruce only many, many years before, Vinny used to live in Connecticut. He used to live in Connecticut. He used to live about maybe an hour and 15 minutes from me when I lived in Woodstock. And we would come home from Sting tours and we would hook up sometimes. You know, we weren't that far apart. You know, he would, whether he's coming through somewhere or whatever, we'd have occasion to see each other. So we were home. We had a big break on a Sting tour. He said, hey, man. Oh, he was going to visit his mom in, in Pennsylvania. That's what it was. So he said, well, come by the house. So he did the same thing I did with me. He came by my house. He stayed there for three days. It was winter time. I remember it was kind of cold and crazy. But he stayed there for three days. And we basically had like a pajama party with, with music. You know, we just stayed up. We got real comfortable. We got the food and stuff we wanted in there. Robert Fraza was the engineer on the session. Uh, and we just, I, we did it for a solid like three days, you know. And then he carried on and went to see his mom and then life went on. Yeah. That is brilliant. No, I think that shows that, yeah, again, a testament to your relationship uh, just with musicians, but let alone drummers. And David, um, speaking of great drummers, I know um, Eric Clapton's had some great drummers over the years. I just want to talk briefly about your touring and, and relationship with Eric Clapton. And I even want to talk a little bit about Father Ted. Father, oh, okay. All right. All right, man. Come on. <laughs> Well, I got to say that that Eric Clapton tour that I had the good fortune to do, 2001, this was one of the best projects of, of that type. It was a year long. We started rehearsing uh, in London in January, and we stopped in Tokyo a, a few days before Christmas. And I personally, there were tears backstage. People were, it, people were saying goodbye, and just it was just a lovely atmosphere. He said himself... He said uh, at the end of it, we had a nice dinner with uh, uh, Mr. Udo, the uh, chief promoter in Japan, who puts all that together, thanking everyone. He said, I don't know when I'll ever be able to put a band like this together again, but it's been such a, this is Eric's words, just saying it, how much he appreciated the, all the, the talent and, the, and what everyone put into it. But it was great. Um, and again, very special for me because, you know, uh, Eric, Jack, Cream as a band were a major influence on me. My band's back, favorite bands were Jimi Hendrix and Cream, and a huge Jeff Beck fan, of course, which is a whole other, you know, situation. But for me to actually get to work with Eric in that city, and that's and Jack as well. I worked while I was in a band with Jack in 1980. Jack was in friends with Billy Cobham. So not to go back to that again, but. Um, yeah, to, to, to get the call to, uh, to work with Eric was, was fabulous. I met him doing a, a tour with this Italian artist, Zucchero, who I'm sure you know, uh, yeah, very big in Italy. Yes. And um, uh, they shared a manager at one point, Roger Forrester, was Zucchero's manager as well, before they, and that's a whole other 
conversation. <laughs> uh, but that's how I met Eric. He was very complimentary <clears throat> to me once he saw me play with Zucaro. <clears throat> he liked my guitar playing, excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, what else can I say? He became, again, not, I didn't have that much contact when I wasn't with him, but every time I sort of came across him, uh, it was very, very pleasant. I remember one time we were, uh, it was a Sting tour, uh, and we were playing um, the Albert Hall, one of those runs of like maybe four or five nights in a row. And we had, we were somehow rehearsing something new at the Townhouse Studio in London. Do you remember? Do you know that? Okay. I've heard of that, yeah. Okay. It was, uh, I don't know if it's even still operating, but it was the place to be, uh, it was the major studio in London at the time. It was just, it was in Shepherd's Bush, right? So, okay, for some reason, uh, I had to be at the studio to do a rehearsal with Sting for something. And we were in Studio B. In Studio A, the largest room, is guess who? Eric Clapton. Okay? So, because the traffic was really crazy that day, and they sent a car for me. You were not on your own to, to like, get there. They said, you're going to be, you know, be in a lobby at such and such a time. There'll be a car there to take you to rehearsal. Okay? And, but it was just crazy traffic. You know, London traffic is insane. Okay? Just so, I'm, like, ten minutes late, you know, whatever. I get in, <laughs> And I remember they, they, they cracked up because <laughs> everything was ready for me. They were already playing songs. Sting really likes to be on time, prompt. Right? So, okay, the song was underway. And I actually walked in the room, was able to walk to my keyboard station, sit down and join in the middle of the flipping song. Because everything was like that ready. You know, my technician had me all like, you know, questions for me. It's like, you know, <laughs> waiting for you. So I did that, and we all kind of cracked up. We said, no, what happened? What happened? Late, late, late. So then we go, hey, Eric's next door. Go, Let's go say hi. And I walked in there, and, you know, I see Eric, and he goes, hmm, what's he shaking hands? And he goes, uh, you know, oh, man, how are you doing? You know, everything's great. I haven't seen you in a long time. He goes, listen, uh, I'd love to have you involved in, in something at some point, you know. And I said, great, listen, please just call anytime. And so you know, it was a couple years after that that I, he actually did... Uh, I did call, and then uh, I was actually what ha it, it, all this is a bit too much to go into. It's like the details of a of a, a, a self-employed uh, <laughs> working class musician, a, a guy, a per like an actor. You know, musicians and and what Absolutely. we do. <clears throat> you're like an actor. You're you're as good as till your next film, and you're the film you just finished could have been it might be winning an Oscar in a couple of months, and you were seriously well paid. But technically, after that, you don't have another project. You know what I mean? So everyone's sort of, it's your leap project from thing to thing. And, and luckily, in the course of things, people can have, you can have a nice, long succession of, of work, you know, very positive, that can go unbroken for quite a while. But it doesn't always work like that. So I was working very successfully with Seal for about three years as his musical director. And then the bottom fell out from his project, Again, too long to go into. And Eric's people had called me to do a project uh, where he was touring with a small orchestra, a string orchestra. And it was in 1998. Roger Forrester called me and said, hey, we're doing this thing. Could you do it? And I already committed to Seal. I already had a contract signed with him to do a, you know, a record and a tour. And I was his musical director. So I had to you know, say no. Then that fell apart. So then I called up... Uh, the office. So suddenly I have no work at all. The thing that they wanted me to do is like down the road. The thing I was going to do is not happening. I get on the phone, which is what musicians do. When you don't have work, the first thing you do is call your call your pals, call your friends. You know, hey, what's up? <laughs> what are you doing? What's going on? You need any help, you know? Anyway, I rang up and I called his office and I was able to speak to the same secretary, I believe, I think I told Roger Forrester personally that, oh, thanks very much, but I can't do it. When I called back the office and I spoke to his secretary, his assistant, that I'd spoken to him before about something else. And I said, hey, listen, please tell Eric that um, I've had a dramatic change in my schedule. And um, whatever he's up to next year, if he's interested in having me, I, I'd be willing to do it. Great. She said, I'll be sure to let him know. We took all our numbers and everything. 
time goes by. Now I'm just, I'm home. I'm just like sweating. It's summertime. I'm like, oh, I'm unemployed. <laughs> I should have been really well employed, you know. And, and not just that, just the money, the music, the whole situation. It's like, anyway, you, you sweat through that. So one fine day, the phone rings. And this is, again, going back to answer machines. You remember an answer machine with, the, I don't know, maybe. Speak? Absolutely. All right. So I used to have my answer machine. My wife had one on her side of the uh, uh, bed stand. I had my own machine on my side and I had the volume up. And for some reason, man, I just happened to be walking up from the studio, which was in the basement of the house, into the bedroom to get something. I walk in the bedroom, the machine kicks in and he goes, hello, I, is this home of Dave Sanctious? And it's fucking, it's Eric. Is Eric calling me? I'm, and I I recognize his voice. Eric has a very non English English accent. It's very soft. It's not very broad. It's like the way the farmers talk, like up in Devon, you know. It's very very soft. So it's, oh, that's L. So then I I, I walk over and I'm fuck Eric. I was going. I walk over to the phone, and I pick it up. And I'm first of all I'm so excited, and I'm so happy that like something's happening in my life. That for a minute I couldn't say hi. I had the phone in my hand. I was like, uh, I used to stammer when I was a kid. When I was really little, I got over. It. And I got the phone in my hand. I'm like, uh, hi, <laughs> hi. Yeah, this is David. <laughs> yes, it's me. And everything. We had a great conversation, and he ran the whole thing down to her, and then it, it happened. But you know, apart from all that thing, that is a great project. That was so well recorded. That's a live double album and a video. I, the, it's all over the place. It's been forever, years and stuff. I've got yeah. a proper high-res copy of it. But what a great production. He put so much thought into how that was filmed. That was a five-camera shoot in high def. Um, great editing. And the audio, his audio crew is insane. We one time had a sound check. We had a sound check in Tokyo one time. It was so funny. It's just how well, and everyone was getting along so well. We just enjoyed each other's company so much. So we had a sound check one time. And at the end of the sound check, and I remember he wanted to do a new song. We were going to do a version of White Room, which was not in the set, you know, but which I used to play when I played with Jack. And then he goes, we got to get you on something on guitar, Dave. And says, well, and that's when he asked me to play Layla uh, that night. He says, I can't really sing and do that riff at the same time always, so... How about, you know, you do that, da 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 da, -da and all the riffs in between. So, great. so, anyway, we did the sound check for that, worked out all that. And at the end of the sound check, it was so satisfying. He says, he gets on the mic and goes, we could just all go home to dinner now and just, we don't need an audience. Just call it off. Let's go all have lunch. It was, it was that satisfying. He was joking. He, he, nothing disrespectful or weird. It was just that the sound check was yeah. so satisfying had so much energy in it and so well performed and received. It's like, yeah, it was just calling a night, <laughs> you know, you know, it's a, it's a that's subtle, brilliant. It's not translating as you kind of, you had to be there. I kind of think. Yeah, so. no, but I think that's, that's great. And again, I mean, that's a testament to the yeah, success of the band and, and I'm going to skip over the father Ted stuff because we're running out of time, David, sure. but just for our listeners that aren't aware, it's a classic British TV show sets, um, in Ireland? Oh, now I'm confused. Anyway, I've watched yeah, them all. Northern and, um, England. I, Northern, Northern, Northern England. It is Northern Star England. Star, Star yeah. step on you. Father Ted goes like this. Eric had this entertainment system where we could watch videos and stuff before you go on stage. And the idea was we would all go on stage laughing, like relaxed. And Father Ted was flipping hysterical. So we'd either put on an episode of Father Ted or uh, the movie uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? was on at the time. He got a copy of that. And, and by the time, we all knew it like line by line. So we'd watch some of that or an episode of Father Ted. And the, the tour manager knocked on the door. Guys, come on, time to get on stage. And we're all standing up. We're splitting ourselves laughing as we're walking on stage. That's what that was about. Just this yeah. great atmosphere of of um, lightness and, and energy before you play. Yeah, so. no, highly recommended. So, David, we'll, we'll close out with two questions. Um, your experience as part of the original E Street Band is well documented, so I don't want to bore you too much with that. So I'm, I'm going to ask you one question only, and that is, can you think of a question over years that no one's asked you about those early Springsteen years that you've always wondered why you haven't been asked, or just a favourite recollection? One time, 
We were on a beach in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, which is a bit further south in my neighborhood. Not a lot of people of my color. But we were playing there in a town. And I was the only, you know, I was young. I was the youngest one in the band. And it was like, you know. Anyway, I'm sitting on my, on my own on a day off. Or at least an afternoon off. And suddenly there's a two, two white guys, older than me, bigger than me. They started saying things to me and sort of threatening me. And like looking at really threatening in my direction and like just being verbally kind of like like abusive, like kind of taunting me. Suddenly, Bruce got wind of it because we're all on the same beach. He's walking around and he sees I'm like having a, some words with these characters. So he sees what's going on. He sits down next to me. I'm sitting on a beach bank. He sits down next to me. He picked up a piece of driftwood and he put it in his hand like this. And he stares at these fuckers. He just stared at them. And he kept hitting his hand like, really? And he just stares at them. And, and then suddenly, after that, here comes Clarence Clemens down the way, who was literally the big man. He sees what's going on. He sits down next to me. Now it's the three of us. And we're staring these fuckers down. And Clar Clarence didn't have to pick up anything or say anything. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the end of any trouble for me, you know. I remember that. They, that is know. a that is a wonderful yeah. recollection. That is amazing, David. And and knowing that you need to go, um, we're not going to let you escape without the Desert Island Discs question. So five albums yeah. that really have inspired your life. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, Band of Gypsies, um, that uh, Fillmore thing with the, with a, a machine gun on it. You know that one. The original release, not all these other afterwards, but that one. That one for sure. Uh, oh, the skills go deep, Hendrix. Uh, Electric Ladyland. The, the Planets by Gustav Holst. The Preludes of Chopin. Great. I'm up to four. Jimmy Smith on the organ. There's a uh, live Great, title, Jimmy Smith Live at somewhere. My dad used to take nice. me to see him live in Asbury Park. I can't tell you we because my dad was the biggest fan of jimmy smith organ music we had all the records and every now and then he would play in our town like eight miles away i got to see him play live like up close wow it was insane yeah no that is insane um david i cannot thank you enough you've been more than generous with your time oh, and as you've alluded to yourself we've not even scratched the surface with uh, <laughs> zucchero and jack bruce and yeah and too much. But <laughs> cannot th cannot thank you enough. It's a stellar career with many many more years to go, and um, yeah. we look forward oh, to keeping in touch and seeing what's next. David, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Any time at all you want to talk about anything, I'm at your disposal. And there we have it. We hope you enjoyed that interview. Paul is an apology. Uh, living the life of a musician, Paul needed to jump on a flight for the last part of the interview. So I'm wrapping up here solo, but a huge thanks to Paul for, for sitting in for the majority of the interview. Couldn't have done it without you, sir. Um, so yeah, it was an absolute pleasure talking to David. Um, and as I mentioned in the, the end there, we barely scratched the surface um, of what is an absolutely amazing career with a, a lot of legs left in it. So yeah, thank you for listening to these two parts of the show. Uh, we'll be back again in a week or two, uh, but I do want to give a quick shout out to our gold and silver supporters uh, in no particular order, midnightmastering.com. If you're creating your own music and want someone that is price sensitive but high quality, midnightmastering.com is the place to go. I've used them personally and very happily recommend them. Uh, Radio Grande, a YouTube channel. Thank you, Radio Grande and the team there. They do bring you funk and soul reimaginings of some pretty iconic songs. Uh, well worth a check out. Tammy Catcher of Tammy's Musical Stew, a huge supporter of the show, and we can't thank you enough, Tammy, as always. The musicplayer.com forums. Again, been a member of those communities for 20 years and intend on doing it for another 20. Thank you, Dave and the team there. And for, last but definitely not least, Brother Paul Brown from The Water Boys. Thank you, sir, for your ongoing support. And as I've said many times, if you haven't seen Brother Paul Brown's interview on the show itself before he became a supporter, definitely worth a check out. So we love hearing from you. And uh, again, I, I do want to call out, we've, but we've had a, seen a tick up in um, people reaching out to us. We do hugely appreciate it. We love hearing from you. 
Um, and you can do that via a few means, via our Instagram, which is the, the, the Keyboard Chronicles, same as Facebook, it's just search for the Keyboard Chronicles. Um, our email address is editor at keyboardchronicles.com and we're on Twitter, for what that's worth now, at the keyboard chr1. Uh, we are also on LinkedIn and TikTok if you're super keen. Um, if you'd like to become an official supporter, we do have a Patreon account where for the price of a coffee a month, you can help us go from strength to strength. Uh, and you also do get early access to a number of these episodes, get further input into questions for guests and suggest guests you'd like to see interviewed yourself. So if you're interested in that, patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. Thank you again for listening as always. We hugely appreciate it and we'll see you back here next episode.